Hello everyone, welcome to Columbia Health Talks, Columbia Asia Hospital, Sarjapur Road. In this session, we have Dr. Joseph Xavier, Senior Consultant, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery, Columbia Asia Hospital, Sarjapur Road. So Dr. Joseph, could you tell us about the congenital heart diseases that are quite common? And are there any such congenital heart disease conditions that would need surgical correction in the first month of life? The common uh, congenital heart diseases are like in layman's term, a uh, hole in the heart, which usually uh, refers to either uh, ASD or a VSD. So most people think that the congenital heart disease is only about holes. But uh, actually there are uh, a large number of varied defects that form in the heart. The simplest of them being a hole, but the hole can be part of a very complex problem. So therefore it is always necessary to have a very accurate uh, diagnosis. And today uh, you would have heard one of my colleagues speak about uh, uh, diagnosis in fetal life uh, about uh, cardiac uh, deformities. So from fetal life it is possible to diagnose it. And uh, we plan the treatment according to the severity of the condition. So simple procedures may sometimes, uh, it may be possible to wait for some time, allow the child to grow and then correct it. But more complex problems may require correction at as early as in the newborn period. So there are some conditions where uh, the child requires immediate uh, admission to an intensive care and followed by surgery. If such conditions are detected uh, uh, before birth, then you can plan the delivery in a center where such amenities are available uh, and then have the birth there and then they, the corrective surgery can be done immediately after. So usually these conditions are a set of conditions called as duct dependent circulations. So they where the ductus arteriosus, it's a vessel which uh, shunts blood uh, away from the lung when the, in the, during the intrauterine life. And post birth, in normal children, that duct closes. But in children who don't have a normal uh, circulation going to the lungs, uh, they are dependent on this uh, passage between the body's circulation and the lungs circulation to keep blood going to the lungs and remain alive. So, all children who have de defects where the blood is not able to reach the lungs other than through this passage require an urgent surgery in as soon as they are born, maybe the first couple of days or sometimes in the first week. And there are other conditions like transposition of great arteries which may require a surgery within the first three weeks. So there are certain conditions where the child requires surgery that early and other surgeries can be planned and there are times like for instance if there's a big hole uh, which is a VSD which is a very big hole you may need to do a surgery uh, depending on how the child behaves the child is very breathless not able to uh, feed properly not gaining weight then we may need to operate as infants maybe at three months six months nine months. And there are other conditions where you know you, you can wait for some time and do it at two years or three years. Most of the surgeries are nowadays done in the preschool period so that you know there is no psychological impact of cardiac illness on children who have uh, these kind of uh, lesions. So uh, do these children need multiple uh, surgeries? Yeah, there are certain conditions which require uh, multiple surgeries for its full correction. So we may do one like I told you at uh, as soon as they are born and then the next one may be at nine months of age because you need to have a different passage uh, to be created and then uh, maybe at five years and so depending on what kind of surgery we are doing, it may there may be surgeries periodically like five years then maybe when they are 12 years till they become uh, adult size. It's largely related to the child is growing so whatever tubes we place for 
uh, con for, as a conduit to conduct the blood from uh, a particular part of the heart to the lungs. Uh, that may require a change going forward. So, because the child outgrows his uh, tube, so we need to replace that. So, it's mostly those kind of surgeries that need to be done as multiple operations. So, what would be the, uh, you know, um, frequency or the, you know, the timeline as to when these, these surgeries would be repeated? It's like I told you, uh, at nine months, if once done in infancy, it may, the next one may be done at nine months or it may be at three years. Uh, and then uh, maybe when the child is a little bigger, six years, then when the child is still bigger. So, so how it, safe is it to carry out such procedures? Yeah, yeah. With modern uh, uh, techniques and the instrumentation that we have, it has become fairly safe. Earlier, when, whenever there was a re-operation for a heart condition, we used to give a much uh, higher risk, uh, maybe 20% risk of mortality. But today, it's just like any other surgery. We don't give uh, very high risk just because it's a re-operation. We explain that there is a certain element of risk in going back into the chest to do a re-operation. But most of the times, we come out unscathed. Now, as uh, most of us are aware that congenital heart surgery is not done in every center, every medical center. So what is so special about this uh, congenital heart disease surgeries that it is, it is carried out in very few select places? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good uh, question. See, uh, dealing with children as such is uh, very... Uh, complex uh, issue because uh, they are not just only that it's it's not only that's that they are they are small but everybody looking after children have to uh, be specially trained to look after them so if it's whether it's looking after whether it's making a diagnosis in them and whether it is operating on them you need a special skill set and this is difficult to duplicate across uh, centers because uh, you don't find uh, enough number of people training themselves to be able to take care of a child in the intensive care or to be able to make a diagnostic procedure on a on a child or to do a surgery on a child to do and that also a heart surgery it takes uh, it takes special training and only those who are who have the interest and the uh, keenness to spend many extra working hours to deal with children, actually get involved in the care of children with heart disease. And that is why uh, the centers also have to uh, be special, specialized. And it involves a lot of uh, infrastructure. So there's a lot of capital investment and uh, there's continuous skill training which is uh, required, which is what makes it special. <clears throat> now, going back to the initial question I asked, how very common is congenital heart diseases? And do all children with congenital heart disease need a surgery? Or are there any other treatment options available? Yeah, so the <clears throat> there are no uh, definite uh, statistics uh, in, in in the Indian scenario to tell you how common is uh, congenital heart disease in India, but uh, by the rule of the thumb, if you extrapolate uh, certain statistics available from few centers uh, that deal with congenital disease, uh, roughly it works out to about eight to ten per thousand live-born children will have a congenital heart disease. In this, uh, so if you if you uh, extrapolate it to the population, the general population, and you uh, apply the, uh, the birth rate that is existent in our country, then we are looking at something like 2 lakh uh, children being born uh, every year. But then all these 2 lakh children are not being, are not receiving treatment. So there will always be some which adds on. So the, the pop, the, 
the number of children with congenital heart disease in the country is huge. We really don't know how many uh, children are like that. And what is the other part you wanted to know? Do all children diagnosed with congenital heart disease need a surgery? Yeah, so all don't require a surgery. There may be some minor things which uh, we can uh, wait and watch and they may, they may correct by itself. Or there may be some, they may, may be maintaining a balance which uh, allows them to live on without uh, too much trouble. And so they also are not uh, operated on. And all don't require surgery. Yeah, we can, there are a whole lot of procedures which can be, a uh, whole lot of conditions which can be done by uh, procedures like uh, a, a cardiac catheterization. So it's a catheter based procedure. So you uh, basically uh, you treat the child in a cat lab, similar to how an angiogram is done. So you put some wires through the blood vessels into the heart and then you can plug the holes or you can dilate a valve uh, and things like that. So there are uh, a number of uh, conditions can be treated without surgery. What would be your advice on the preventive measures? Yeah, so I think uh, this is a very uh, commonly uh, discussed topic and general population is quite aware of this. but. Uh, people are very reluctant to change their lifestyle. You know, so there are a lot of causes that can be corrected. For instance, uh, the level of exercise that you do, the, um, the diet you have, you know, if the diet is uh, very rich in calories, which is, and calories come from both fats and sugars. So if, if your concept is that only fat leads to or oil leads to coronary disease, that's very wrong. Because every any extra sugar that you consume, the body is converting into fat. So fats and sugars have to be reduced. Then there is the, the plague of uh, tobacco. Tobacco is probably a highly injurious uh, substance to the coronaries. And uh, people are so reluctant to give up. And even though they know the ills of tobacco use, they still continue to use tobacco in various forms. Then there is today's modern day uh, factor, which is stress. Everybody is uh, rushing. There's no uh, time to relax. And uh, everybody is into a competitive spirit. So that just adds to the stress. And nobody wants to give up that either. So. These are the common things that uh, can lead to uh, coronary artery disease. And so that's why we are seeing it at uh, a younger age. Uh, we have some very unique uh, reasons also. For instance, uh, uh, I'm uh, in my family, I'm one among four siblings. Okay. And in my in earlier generation, uh, it was more, maybe six children, seven children in a family. Now we have only one child in a family. It's a totally different uh, scenario. So that child is uh, well fed, he sits in front of a computer, he doesn't go out to play, he has no uh, uh, interest in uh, mixing. So he tends to have what we today call as uh, uh, childhood obesity. And there, are, there have been studies which have shown that childhood obesity leads to early coronary disease. So, you know, all the time, I'm sure most of the pediatricians also face this day. Mother comes and says, this child is not eating, not putting on weight. And when we put the child on the scale, he is above the growth curve weight. But still, parents are not happy that they are uh, not fat enough. So, this again is a misconception in that it will lead to problems. So, that is again something that needs to be looked at to prevent uh, coronary disease. So, uh, apart from the preventive measures, now if at all a patient presents with a coronary heart disease or commonly known as a heart artery block, what would be the means of treatment? Is a surgery always advisable or stents advisable? Yeah, so here uh, both modalities have, uh, of treatment have their place. So, I would like to first talk about 
and uh, heart attacks. When you have a heart attack, you go to the nearest uh, cardiac center. And uh, today we have a procedure called this uh, primary angioplasty. That is what they do is as soon as you have a heart attack, you reach the hospital within an hour, then they do an angiogram. And if they, they see which artery got blocked, and they try to relieve that block by removing the clot and uh, expanding the lesion which caused the clot and placing a stent. So you have here you have a 100% uh, winner for a stent being the modality of uh, treatment which was really life saving. So in that situation, a stenting is what needs to be done. Now, if you look at uh, coronary disease which is chronic and existing for some time, then there are certain well laid out uh, criteria for which modality is better. So if you have a if you are not a diabetic and if you have a very uh, discrete, that means a point lesion on your coronary artery, which can be uh, uh, you know expanded and a stent placed, then that is the uh, role for a stent to be used. But let us say uh, you you uh, have multiple uh, lesions in the heart, and uh, you are also diabetic, or even if you are not diabetic, you have multiple lesions then probably a bypass operation is uh, better for such individuals. Uh, also, if you uh, you are a person who cannot uh, take uh, blood thinners for any given reason, let's say you have a bleeding, uh, you have an ulcer in the stomach or you have a bleeding piles, or you have some condition that needs a surgery in the future there where you need to put, uh, to stop blood thinners, then again, surgery is a better choice because once you have a stent in your coronary artery, then it is difficult to stop the uh, blood thinners without the risk of that stent getting uh, blocked, particularly in the period that is uh, in the first six months following a stenting. Later on, that risk may become less. Uh, coming, uh, I mean, going to the question on bypass surgery. How many times can a person undergo a bypass surgery, if at all? The so usually uh, the bypass surgery, uh, uh, if it is uh, uh, done on vessels with good quality and the grafts are also good quality, then it lasts uh, for 15, 20, 25 years sometimes. So we don't really need to go in again for a bypass surgery. And uh, But there are that one-off case where you, you would have to go and do a re- uh, bypass of the vessels because whatever grafting was done initially has got blocked. Uh, here also the the way it is being treated has changed over the years because if I look back uh, uh, 15 years ago, the instance of uh, doing re-operations for bypass was quite common. But now uh, with more advance in the way the cardiologists are able to do uh, catheter-based uh, interventions, uh, there are a whole lot of them which have come, like you can burr through a calcific vessel, you can, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, study the lesions more carefully and then plan your procedure according to that. So a lot of re uh, situations where a re-operation would have been necessary earlier are now today amenable with, uh, with uh, stenting. So, it's not so often that we do a re-operation for coronary artery uh, bypass nowadays, but it can be done. So what precautions uh, the patient needs to follow after a bypass surgery? After bypass surgery, uh, we usually get them up on their feet the next day. And from there on, it's go. That means you keep improve, increasing your level of activity. So we want people to uh, uh, be active, walk daily 40 uh, minutes and gradually increase the speed of walking so that they are uh, walking briskly for 40 minutes. And we uh, actively encourage them to do stretch exercises and uh, muscle toning exercises. Besides this, they need to give up all the uh, habits that could have caused this, like for instance, smoking or uh, if uh, they were short-tempered and uh, you know, uh, you know, 
stressed from whatever they need to do, uh, we advise uh, some forms of meditation, yoga to, to improve that situation. And of course, diet. We advise them to stay off uh, fried food and junk food and uh, eat what is uh, healthy food which is cooked at home. More protein, more vegetable, uh, less of uh, carbohydrates and sweets. So these are the modifications that uh, one needs to make after the surgery. And they are the same things, if you notice, they are the same things that prevent a coronary event. So I understand that following these precautions, they could lead a normal lifestyle post heart surgery. Is that what you yes, want to tell us? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, what is a minimally invasive surgery of the heart, doctor? So, minimally invasive in the common man's uh, understanding is what they call as the keyhole surgery. So, basically, you make smaller incisions and do your procedures through less cutting of the skin and bone and muscle. The idea is to make it uh, more uh, painless. So this is a minimal, technically speaking, this is a minimal access. That is, you, you, you make your entry into the body cavity or the heart small. But uh, minimally invasive can also mean like you, we use a heart-lung machine. So if you don't use an heart-lung machine, it's less invasive. If you, uh, you, you do something uh, like you stop the heart to do a surgery, if you can do the same thing without stopping the heart, that is also minimally invasive. So if you, you, you don't give a transfusion, for instance, so you do things in a way that blood transfusion is avoided, that's also minimally invasive. So you're not invading the body uh, in, in a way uh, in which um, uh, the body's physiology is uh, altered. So there is a subtle difference between minimal access and minimal, minimally invasive, but it's usually rolled into one. So in bo uh, we try to be minimally invasive and we try to do it through smaller accesses. So through a keyhole, this requires uh, a special instrumentation and it requires some, some special skills to, to do this. And we do it quite often. So is this done in all the centers or again as for uh, the congenital heart diseases in very few centers? Yeah, this is also something, uh, it's a niche area of treatment. So it's not done in all centers, uh, but more and more centers are doing it. We do it in Kolmbesia, uh, Sarjapur Road. Uh, but we are a old team, a senior team that has come into a new hospital. So we have been doing this for a for many years. It does require some amount of uh, skill sets. You need to be good at what is uh, not minimally invasive to then start doing what is minimally invasive. That's the reason why it's not done so commonly. Now, the next uh, uh, query would be on what is an aneurysm? Aneurysm is basically just a uh, bulge in the blood vessel of the body. This can happen in uh, any blood vessel in the body. So if you can have an aneurysm of the brain, you can blood vessel in the brain, uh, you can have an aneurysm of a peripheral artery, like uh, you know the artery going to your leg, a femoral artery aneurysm. Uh, so there are, and there are different causes for that. So uh, when we as cardiovascular and thoracic surgeons, when we talk about aneurysm, it's usually aneurysm of the Aorta. Aorta is the largest uh, uh, blood vessel which uh, leaves the heart, takes the blood to all the different parts of the body. So this vessel can, get, uh, can you know, for in various uh, conditions, this vessel can expand, it can bulge, and then it weakens, and then the risk is that it can, it can rupture. So aneurysm, once diagnosed, uh, needs uh, to be treated. So here again, you have uh, both types of treatment in some situations, like if it is in the beginning of the aorta, close to the heart, then it has to be treated with a surgery. If it is in the arch of the aorta, that is the area which gives rise to the blood vessels to the neck, again, it has to be treated uh, 
with uh, surgery. If it is in the descending aorta, that is the uh, aorta which is in the, in the chest cavity, then you have an option. You can either do it with surgery or you can do it with a stenting. So we have covered stenting. So it's called as an endovascular stenting. So you, you stent with a uh, 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 covered uh, tube so that the aneurysm is excluded from the circulation. So the dangers in an aneurysm, uh, one is that it could rupture and second is it can form some thrombus. You know, the blood can clot inside that and then it, that clot can go out from there and block some vital arteries in the body. So are there any uh, risk factors for developing an aneurysm? Yeah, there is a common uh, condition called as uh, uh, Marfan's syndrome. It's a genetic uh, abnormality. Uh, people who have this uh, genetic abnormality, they tend to develop vascular, that is, you know, their blood vessels can dilate and cause uh, aneurysms. It can also have uh, infective uh, pathology, like uh, it's not so common now, but um, there was a sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. And the third, uh, an important cause which is more common is atherosclerosis. It is a kind of degeneration of the blood vessels that take place with age and uh, hypertension, that is high BP is one of the causes that accelerates atherosclerosis. So patients uh, who have a predisposition to atherosclerosis, they can even sometimes if their hypertension is uncontrolled uh, at a younger age, can develop an aneurysm much earlier. <clears throat> so these are the usual uh, common causes for aneurysms forming. And uh, when we are speaking about aneurysm, we should also talk about aortic dissection, where you know it's an acute cardiac emergency, where the this big blood vessel splits through its layers. And one of the commonest causes for this is atherosclerosis. So it's important, again, control of BP becomes a very important thing for preventing such calamities. Now we hear that in India, people have diseases of the heart valve, which is supposed to be quite common. Could you tell us a few things about the heart valve diseases and the diagnosis and the treatment part of it? Uh, well, it's unfortunate that even though uh, we have advanced uh, in uh, medicine so much, uh, rheumatic heart disease, which is actually caused by uh, bacteria that uh, cross-reacts in, uh, in, in its immune system with the uh, heart valves of the humans, uh, results in the valves being damaged. Now, valves are structures inside the heart which regulate the direction of flow in, within the heart. Like if from one chamber to the next, there's a valve in between. So that it flows in one direction, does not allow flow in the back in the reverse direction. So these valves get affected uh, by the body's own immune system, which is actually reacting to a, to a bacteria called the streptococcus. It's, uh, it usually infects the throat or sometimes the skin. And uh, a cross reaction with that uh, bacteria's, uh, you know, the immune, uh, immune representation uh, results in this disease. And it's very common in India. Because most of the uh, population is uh, from a poorer socioeconomic strata. They don't go for a proper treatment of a throat infection. And that results in uh, this unfortunate situation where the valves get diseased. And uh, you can have the presentation from childhood to uh, old age at any time. And the different valves of which commonly affected are the mitral and the aortic valves. Uh, they need to be uh, tria, you know, either opened up if it shrinks or uh, if, it if it's causing a leak through the valve, then it sometimes needs to be repaired if it can be repaired. So in children, we try to repair it uh, as far as possible. But in older patients we, where repair is not possible, we may re uh, replace it. And uh, the problem is that once the valve is replaced, one needs to be on medication to see that blood doesn't clot on this valve. So that again involves monthly uh, 
checkups with uh, blood tests to see that the drug is uh, administered at the correct dose. So it's really a cost intense as well as uh, you know the time intense uh, work uh, treating this uh, val particular valve disease. <clears throat> and uh, it can be treated uh, sometimes with a balloon if it requires only to be dilated, opened up. If it needs surgery for a repair or a replacement. And uh, nowadays the latest advance is that you can, you can implant a valve without actually having to do uh, open heart surgery. You can, uh, it's called the TAVI or the tower where you know you trans arterial uh, valve replacement. So it's catching on. We have just started doing it in our centers in the city and uh, only uh, expense of that procedure is more so, it's not so commonly done. So do these patients have a long-term follow-up with the, uh, do they have to have a long-term follow-up? Yes, lifelong follow-up. Lifelong. And is there any uh, precautions that they have to take? Uh, largely, they we, we tell them not to play uh, body contact sports like football and uh, maybe uh, kabaddi and things like that where, you know, they are likely to be pushed or hit so that... Um, uh, they are on anticoagulants, basically the blood doesn't clot. So let's say a normal person is uh, hit on the stomach uh, and there's a small injury which uh, happens as a minor bleed in any of the internal organs. It just stops because the body's own clotting mechanism can seal it. But those who are on anticoagulants, that doesn't happen. So the bleed just increases and you can have a fatal bleed sometimes. So we don't allow that. Barring that, uh, there are some dietary restrictions to like uh, not to eat certain kinds of uh, vegetables and fruits which will interfere in the, in the medication. That's about the precautions. And of course, they need to take care of any infections very uh, um, early. If you have a chest infection, you don't just wait with that, but you go to a doctor and get it treated early so that the valve doesn't get infected. Any infection that can spread to the bloodstream has a risk of getting the valve infected. Thank you, Dr. Xavier. With that, we come to the end of the session. Thank you for highlighting the various aspects of congenital heart disease, heart blocks, aneurysms, and heart valve disease. Thank you. Welcome.